great time of worship. You know, um, uh, this was one of those worship times that we had where, uh, uh, and, and this happens frequently, but this was one of those times where, like, I had that feeling of, uh, oh, you know what, let's just pray. Uh, let, let's just uh, uh, let's just surrender ourselves to the Lord, and like, we can just stop here. Um, so uh, while we were worshiping, I just had this. Uh, good sense of the Spirit, a good sense of the Spirit uh, in our midst. And so here's the thing about the, the presence of the Spirit. with us. The Spirit is with us every time we worship. Every time we worship. Now, like there are times when you will think, man, I really felt the Spirit's presence there today. And then there'll be other times when you think, man, I, I just like nothing. Uh, the presence of the Spirit doesn't depend on our feelings. The presence of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit depends on the faithfulness of God, and God is faithful. So the Spirit is always present. So sometimes, sometimes, not always, sometimes it's just a factor of us. Like, how receptive are we? Like, there might be some of you out there today, like I was really feeling it this morning, and there might be some of you out there that's like, what? Like, what? There was nothing for me. Um, yeah, I just want to say that. The presence of the Spirit uh, as we gather together is not dependent on our feelings. It is dependent on the faithfulness of God. And I want, I want us to always recognize, uh, whether we feel it or not, uh, God promises for His Spirit to be in our midst. And He is. And so let's pray, and uh, then we're going to devote ourselves to the Apostles' teaching. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe you're, uh, maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're watching online. Uh, from somewhere, uh, maybe somewhere in town, maybe somewhere in uh, far distant parts, and uh, maybe you were, maybe you were one of those people that was actually paying attention to the lyrics of the the songs that we were singing, and you're thinking like, man, I, I would love to be a part of that. I, I would love, I would love to know what it feels like to run out of my grave, to get out from under. My sense of shame. I'd love to get out from under my the deadness that that's inside of me. Maybe you want to have a sense of uh, what it feels like for God to do a brand new work in your life. And so, God, I'm just, I'm calling on you now, I'm calling on you now. I, there's not one thing whether as pastor or as worship team or anything we do in this church can, can manufacture uh, transformation of our lives. Uh, on, only you can do that. Only you can do that. So we just want to put ourselves, and, and friends, I want you to pray uh, this way. We want to put ourselves before you in such a way that you would transform us. And so that always will mean it always will mean a dying to our old self, which is another way of saying uh, repenting of our sin, but it's dying to our old self, our old way of life. It's trusting that as we do die to our old self, that, that you'll breathe new life into us. By your Holy Spirit, we'll be born again. We'll be alive in Christ, even though once we were dead in our old self. So, friends, I just uh, want to encourage you. I want you to know God has such love for you. You really are people loved by God. And He does want to, uh, to move into your heart forgive your sin, to give you new life. And even in this moment, if you would say yes to Him, He, he will do that. Now, Father, we are always looking to You to do that which we cannot do ourselves. <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> uh, we believe that Your Word is, is life transforming. And so we look at Your Word right now and uh, one way or another, I pray that you would speak to us through it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, if you got your Bible, I hope you do. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And you're like, hey, wait a minute. We were in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 last week. And it's like, hey, wait a minute. That's right. We were. But we really didn't get very far. Uh, like as far as we got was uh, uh, we really just got verse uh, 3 and 4. And uh, this, is what, this is what verses 3 and 4 said. Um, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion. Remember we said the word compassion means to suffer with. To suffer with, that's what it literally means. To suffer with. The Father who suffers with and the God of all comfort. And comfort, we, we said, means uh, to be called alongside of someone. So God, God saves us by his presence. He comes alongside of us. Even before he delivers us, he saves us by his presence. Uh, so he's the God of all comfort, and he, and, and, and he comforts us in all, of, in all of our troubles. So I don't know what kind of troubles you're experiencing right now, but God comforts us in, in all of our troubles. So there's not a trouble that you could be experiencing right now that God is not ready to come alongside of you in. Because that's what the word comfort means, remember? Just keep holding on to that. Like in all of our troubles, He will come alongside of us. So He comes alongside of us in all of our troubles, and that enables us to come alongside of those. That's the rest of verse 4. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Now, I want us to be careful about this because uh, I hear this misinterpreted a lot in a way that it just makes no sense. Uh, uh, God comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. So I've actually heard people say things like, well, you know, the reason that God struck me with cancer was so that I could help other people who have cancer. And I'm always thinking like, really? What? God strikes you with cancer so that you can help another person who has cancer. And I want to say, no, 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 no. Like two weeks ago, we talked about the three places that, that uh, suffering in the world comes from. Uh, and and, and when we said that God's like never the direct, no, I guess it was just last week. God's never the direct cause. And he's not even a, 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 a complicit bystander uh, in it. Um, but the so that, it's, it's, uh, it's really pretty great because if I have, if God has done something in my life, if God has comforted, comforted me in my troubles, that puts me in a position where I'm able to do that for another person. Like God didn't afflict me with it so that would happen. But since it has happened, since that's been the case, like I, I'm able to move on. So like, I, you know, uh, I hope I can... I, I'm always worried about saying things out of turn. Uh, but this is one of the things that our friends who go through any kind of recovery program know really well. Like, am I right? Like, this is what they know really well. Like, they've gone through recovery so they can help another person that needs to, because they know how it works. And so when we experience the comfort of God in our life, we know how it works. So this is kind of leaking into this morning, because what I want to say to you this morning is that... Um, when, when, when we say that God comes alongside of us in our suffering and that God suffers with us, I don't want you to make this like just some kind of an exclusive me and God kind of thing where it's just God and I and, and everybody else don't watch or everybody else don't know. Uh, because what God is doing, so God's work in suffering, one of the things that God is doing is through suffering, he is building community. He is establishing a community of people who find themselves in the midst of trouble, in the midst of suffering, such that what God has done for us, we want to do for others who have gone through similar kinds of suffering and similar kinds of trouble. So today we're talking about, so like last week it was like about, about this, this horizontal, yeah, horizontal relationship between God and I. Like, this is what God does for me in the midst of my suffering. Today we want to talk about the vertical aspect of this. Like, this is what God does amongst us. This is what God is doing amongst us in the midst of our trouble. So here's our problem. 
Here's our problem. And, and if we just stopped at last week, uh, where we're talking about God and us, it would contribute to the problem. I, our problem is, I think, that when we're hurting, we tend to... Uh, so there's a blank there on your insert, and, and you can fill it in any way you want to, because only you know what you tend to do when you're hurting. I can tell you what I tend to do when I'm hurting. When I'm hurting, I tend to isolate. I isolate. Anybody else? Like, you're hurting and you isolate. Like, like I know lots of people who, when they're having trouble, when they're suffering, like, they're not coming to church then. Like, they'll come when they feel better. They'll come when they're in a better mood to worship. And so, we, 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 many of us, I think I'm not alone, many of us isolate when we find ourselves in a time of hurting. So we have this, this little saying that we, that we use, uh, uh, misery loves company. Like, where did that come from? Like, no, it doesn't. Like, sometimes if we're in misery, uh, we can feel better knowing someone else is in misery, but we still don't want their company, right? Misery, I don't think that's right. I don't think misery loves company so much. I'd rather, when I'm in misery, I'd rather just be left alone. Yeah? Well, when I'm in misery, like, I want to pull the covers up over my head. When I'm in misery, I want to skip work. When I'm in misery, I want to skip school. When I'm in misery, when I'm hurting, or so, I want to drive people out of the room. I want to say, leave me alone. Like, I'll get back to you when I'm feeling better. But right now, uh, I, I just would rather be left alone. So I think a lot of us do this. So, like, there's this thing where... Um, Even if we find ourselves in company in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our hurt, even if we find ourselves in company, like, we're, we're going to put a different face on it. You know? Brian's shaking his head, so I'm just, how you doing, Brian? Like, Brian's going to say fine, whether he is or not, right? And, and, <laughs> yeah, and, and so, like, maybe right now that's okay. But we've got to have a community of, of people with whom we can be we can be honest about who we are. This is what God is creating. God is trying to establish a fellowship of suffering, a community of people where hurt and then comfort can happen together. I uh, uh, read this story uh, about Robert Schuller. Uh, how many of you remember Robert Schuller? Like, you got, you got him anywhere in your memory there? Some of you do, some of you don't. So Rob, Robert Schuller was in that first generation of prominent television preachers. So, like, and, and so he's in Garden Grove, California. Uh, that's, a, that's a swanky place. And, and he builds a church, and he calls it the Crystal Cathedral because it's all glass, and it's a classy-looking building. Not sure why he called it a cathedral, because he wasn't a bishop, but uh, it, it's made out of glass, and everything he does is, is first-rate, and I'm not speaking ill of the man at all. Everything is first-rate, uh, first-class, uh, 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 smooth production. Everything was perfect, and, and I mean that, like, perfect. So he's out and about one day, so he's telling this story. He's the one that's telling this story. Uh, so, like, he, he, he wants to put this forth as a good thing. Uh, he's out and about one day, like, maybe he's in the grocery store, can't quite picture it, uh, but he's out in the grocery store, and one of his parishioners sees him and looks at him, and he's just, like, he doesn't have his robe on, but he, he's looking pretty smart. And uh, his parishioner said, every time I see you, every time I see you, 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 you're at your best. Every time I see you, you're looking your best. And he said, his reply was, that's right. That's right. Because if I'm not at my best, you won't see me. What? If I'm not at my best, you won't see me. So I just want to say that this, that kind of mentality is not what God is creating. It's not what he has designed. He has designed us to be in a fellowship of sufferings. Let me tell you how I know that. I've given you a really long time to find your text. Now hopefully you did. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, 
And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I'm going to start at verse 5. Last week we looked at 3 and 4. I'm going to start at verse, at verse 5. And, I, and I'm going to tell you to underline some things. And if it doesn't match the screen, yeah, which it does. There you go, Katie. Uh, uh, so underline these things. For just as we share, like underline, underline the word share. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, So we, as, as followers of Jesus, need to be really careful. Because sometimes our language, the way we say things is that Christ suffered for us. And then the implication, or maybe it's explicitly stated, is so that we don't have to. Friends, I, I, that's just not in the Bible. That's just not in the Bible. Paul repeatedly, Paul talks about completing the sufferings of Christ. That whatever was lacking in the sufferings of Christ, that, that we complete. And here he says, we share, he even says abundantly, we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ. I'm going to say more on that in a minute. So underline the word share, uh, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. So I'm not sure why the NIV translates the words abundantly and abounds uh, as two different words, because it's actually the same word, and it's just overflowing. It's overflowing. So Paul is saying, look, like, like when, when we... So it's enough to be experiencing the suffering and the pain and the hurt that's, that's common to humanity, but then you add that, because we're not excluded from that, you add that to the, to the sufferings that we know that comes as as being a part of the follower, as part of a, being a follower of Jesus, uh, and he says it, it, it overflows. It overflows. It overflows. Uh, is, is the word to choose there. But so does the comfort. Same word. Overflows. It overflows. So the suffering that we experience in Christ overflows, but the comfort also overflows through Christ. And then he says... Uh, if we're distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces you produces in you patient endurance. So patient endurance, that's another thing that God's working in our sufferings, and we're not talking about that right now. I just wanted to point it out to you. Produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings. Okay, like un underline same, like same sufferings. Like That's again, sharing. We're sharing in the suffering of Christ. We're suffering, and then, and then you're sharing the same sufferings that we're sharing. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share, there's that word again, in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Look, uh, some of you really like to really work hard at making sure you get the blanks filled in, right? But you ought to be able to get this, right? So... Uh, when you read the text in 2 Corinthians 1 that we just read, Paul's very clear to say suffering is a shared experience. It's a shared experience. And then likewise, he says comfort is a shared experience. You see, God is using this experience of, of adversity that we go through. He's using it to form community, to shape community. That this is not a community for people who just have it all together. This isn't a community for people that, that got it all figured out or, or who do life perfectly or who always look their best or who are always at their best. God is forming a community of people who like, just know that they hurt. They know that, there's, that there's, there's adversity and hardship involved in our lives. And we don't have to pretend otherwise. This is the kind of community that God is forming. Both suffering and comfort are to be experienced as we live in community with each other, as we share it together. So here's something really interesting. Uh, so sometimes when I say that, it's like the first thought that goes through my head is like, well, it's really interesting to you, but nobody else really cares. So, 
I think this is really interesting. Like, I had you underline the word share or some facsimile thereof, one, two, three, uh, uh, at least four times uh, in, in that passage. And uh, truthfully, uh, I just want to be honest here, uh, the word only shows up once. It only shows up. It's supplied uh, and assumed in the other occasions. But it really only shows up once, and, and, and it shows up in verse 7. It shows up in verse 7 where it says, Our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, that's where the word share actually shows up. But it's a word that some of you, maybe a lot of you, maybe all of you might recognize. It's one of our Christianese words, the word koinonia. Oh, I've heard that word before. Like sometimes we use this word koinonia to talk about the kind of fellowship Christians should experience or, or the kind of community that Christians should experience. Uh, it's the word that we find in, uh, in Acts chapter 2, koinonia. Now, what, what else is interesting about this word is that uh, when we see it, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, like the word share there is used as a verb, but, but it's not really a verb. Like the word that's there is not really a verb. It's, it's actually a noun. You're a sharer in our sufferings. Now, I, I think this is relevant. You're a sharer in our sufferings. Like, you're a shareholder in this company of sufferers. Like, I'm part owner of the pain that you experience. I'm a shareholder. You're part owner in the, in the pain and the hardship that I experience. Because we're all shareholders in this company of sufferers. I think that's pretty great. I think that's pretty great. So the invitation, <laughs> the invitation to be a part of this company of sufferers, this, this fellowship of suffering, the invitation uh, comes from Jesus. So, do you, do you remember, do you remember when Paul first becomes a Christian? Like, he's persecuting the church. Like, he's inflicting suffering on followers of Jesus when he first becomes a Christian. Like, he's on his way to Damascus with orders to arrest and kill people. So that qualifies, right, as inflicting suffering, uh, if you're going to arrest and kill. Um, so he's on the way, and, and a voice from heaven, it's the voice of Jesus, uh, calls out to him and says, Saul, Saul, his Hebrew name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Like the voice came from heaven, it came from Jesus. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? You see, so Jesus recognized himself to be a shareholder in the sufferings that Christians were going through. And he recognized uh, those Christians that we're suffering and being arrested and killed, to be shareholders in his own suffering that he had already gone through. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And uh, so, like, uh, Paul, like, he gives it up, and, uh, and he becomes a believer in Jesus. And, and one of the things that we learn out, uh, later on in the New Testament that's said about Paul is that um, uh, the Holy Spirit said that, that I must show... I, I, I will show him, or I will show you, the things that you must suffer yet for me. What? Like his, his invitation, Paul's invitation into the life of Jesus was actually an invitation into the sufferings of Jesus. So this actually started all the way back in the Gospels. This started at this place where, where I, I like to say is the... the uh, the uh, uh, chronological beginning of Lent. Like Lent begins with, with this conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. And so it's in, um, it's in uh, 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 Matthew 16. Well, and it's in Mark and Luke as well. But in Matthew 16, uh, when we find the story there, 
um, Jesus has, has pulled his 11 away, and, or his 12, sorry, and he says, uh, who do people say that I am? Like he's looking for the confession. Like how are people, how are people estimating me? Who do, they, who do they think I am? And they, they run through this list of, of possibilities of who Jesus might be, and, and Jesus says, well, what about you? What do you think? And Peter comes up with the profound answer that's the right one, where the, the buzzer goes ding, 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 ding. And uh, Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he gets the right answer, but he doesn't really know what it means. So you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, you are, we believe, you are the world's one true king. And, and, and Jesus says, you're right, Peter. And, and then he goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say, and so uh, the Son of Man, how he always referred to himself, uh, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and, and suffer many things. That's what he said. Suffer many things, be handed over to the elders and the chief priests and whoever else, and, and die, and then rise again. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. That's what he said. Uh, like, I just confessed you as the world's one true king. That's, that's not the way. And Jesus said, it is the way. This is the way of the world's one true king. To go through the suffering. To go through the cross. And then Jesus says these very profound words, these, this very profound invitation. Like, if you want a part in me, if you want to be a part of my kingdom, if you want to to follow me in this, well, here's the way it's got to be. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. So this is what we've said every week so far now. The only way to the resurrection is through the cross. The only way to the resurrection is through the cross. This invitation from Jesus is not an invitation to, uh, to always be at our best. It's not an invitation to uh, it's not an invitation uh, to take a stand and and fight a culture war. Like we really love that language. This week I watched a guy on YouTube who uh, I think kind of portrayed uh, a mindset that a lot of the American church likes. Uh, so this was a this was a preacher that, um, and, and, and he was a preacher. Like he had a church, had a platform. Uh, so, uh, like I, I want to say I'm not making fun of him, but it'll sound like I am. Because probably I am. I need to repent. Uh, he looked like he just came out of a WWE ring. All right. He looked like a professional wrestler guy. Like he had that look, uh, and uh, uh, he was dressed. He had a, a T-shirt on that kind of had like, kind of like a tie that looked like a cross, or a cross that looked like a tie. I don't know which it was, and and some kind of a, I think it was like a some kind of a biker type vest, which is which is all fine so far. Uh, but then he had on uh, 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 leggings, so like I just want. I, no, maybe I don't want to know. I want to know if any guys here ever wore leggings. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tim says no. Okay, so here's the irony, though. Uh, he was wearing leggings that were camo. They were camo leggings. And there's this incongruity going on in my mind. Like, wait a minute. Guys that wear leggings don't wear camo, and guys that wear camo don't typically wear leggings. I think. I don't know. They just didn't seem to go together. But there he was just the same. And, uh, and he was strutting, like I mean strutting. He was strutting across the stage. And um, uh, he, was, he was issuing a message of, 
of, of, of, of strength and of power. And he was using fighting words. And, and the last thing I heard him say, uh, and it wasn't the last line of his message, but the, but the last thing I heard him say was that our country is being run by a bunch of wusses, except he didn't use a word that was, he used a word that was much more offensive than wusses. Uh, but it sort of right. Uh, do you know what I want to say is, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. The, the invitation of Jesus was to take up a cross. Follow me. Join me in this, this cross-shaped life that's full of, of sacrificial love, that doesn't fight with the weapons of the world, right? Jesus said, my, my kingdom's not of this world. Meaning, like, I, I don't fight the way you guys do. I, I, got, I got better ways. I got resurrection power coming around the corner here. I don't fight the way you guys do. Uh, my kingdom's not of this world. I go the way of suffering. I go the way of suffering. And it's in his suffering, and it's in our suffering, that we find real life. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. Will find it. So Jesus' invitation to us is to, to take up a cross and to join the company of sufferers. Now that's not real attractive, is it? Like, if you wanna if you wanna have a church full of thousands of people, that might not be the message you'd want to bring. But honest friends, like, look at the text. I, I just, I can't find, I can't find another way other than to say it. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, his quote is in the bottom uh, of, your, of your bulletin there. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor uh, during the Nazi era. Um, and uh, so some would say, like, well, he fought the culture. Well, uh, sort of. I'll, I'll grant you this. Like he was a resistor. He, he was a German resistor. Uh, what he fought more than the culture was the church, because he just couldn't stand how complicit uh, and how involved the church had become uh, in in the way of of, uh, of Hitler and, and and the Nazi Party. So he he actually fought against the church. Uh, so he was a resistor, and and. He understands the invitation of Jesus. So look at how, so this is, this is a pretty, his, the last line here is often quoted, but here's the whole context of it. The cross is laid on every Christian. Well, that's what Jesus said, right? If you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which every man must experience, is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. Amen. And that can be a hard death. It is that dying of the old man, which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. So I'm quoting Bonhoeffer, but that's actually Scripture, right? We surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give our lives, we give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him, come and die. When Christ calls a man, he bids him, Come and die. So, you know, <laughs> uh, so you know the problem with, uh, uh, 
uh, preaching the text uh, instead of your notes is, um, you, you just, you never get through your notes. Uh, but, th- but there's the text, anyway. So, uh, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Maybe we'll finish that next week. I don't know. Well, five weeks in Second Corinthians chapter 1. Um, I, I want you to recognize this as good news. Suffering? Good news? No. Good news that there's a company of sufferers. There's a fellowship of sufferers with Christ, and with one another. Suffering is going to be a part of life, period. So the good news is you don't have to fake it anymore. You don't have to act like you got it all together. You don't need to act like somehow uh, your life is going well because you have a lot of faith and it's not going well because you don't have enough faith. Because that's just not there. Suffering is going to be there. Hardship, adversity is going to be there. The good news is, there are other people that are there as well. And again, as we know the sufferings of Jesus, we know the comfort of Jesus, and and we know it together.